asthma is a significant cause of emergency department visits and deaths in the United States. Each year, it accounts for over 2 million emergency department visits and between 5,000 to 6,000 deaths. Many of these fatalities occur before patients reach the hospital. Severe asthma represents approximately 2% to 20% of admissions to intensive care units. Up to one-third of these patients require intubation and mechanical ventilation. What is a near-fatal asthma attack? Although there are no universally agreed diagnostic criteria, it is typically associated with the presence of hypercapnia, acidemia, altered state of consciousness, and the development of cardiorespiratory arrest requiring endotracheal intubation and mechanical ventilation. Pathophysiology The pathophysiology of asthma involves three key abnormalities, bronchoconstriction, airway inflammation, and mucus impaction. Complications such as tension pneumothorax, lobar atelectasis, pneumonia, and pulmonary edema can contribute to fatalities. Cardiac causes of death are less common in these cases. Clinical features. Wheezing is a common physical finding in patients with severe asthma. However, the severity of wheezing does not correlate with the degree of airway obstruction. The absence of wheezing may indicate critical airway obstruction, while increased wheezing may suggest a positive response to bronchodilator therapy. Oxygen saturation levels may not reflect progressive alveolar hypoventilation particularly if oxygen is being administered. During therapy, oxygen saturation may initially fall because beta agonists produce both bronchodilation and vasodilation, which may increase intrapulmonary shunting. Other conditions that can cause wheezing include pulmonary edema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, pneumonia, anaphylaxis, foreign bodies, pulmonary embolism, bronchiectasis, and sublotic mass. Initial stabilization. Patients with severe life-threatening asthma require urgent and aggressive treatment. Simultaneous administration of oxygen, bronchodilators, and steroids is necessary. Healthcare providers must monitor these patients closely for deterioration. While the pathophysiology includes bronchoconstriction, inflammation, and mucus impaction, only bronchoconstriction and inflammation respond to drug treatment. If the patient does not respond to initial therapy, consultation or transfer to a pulmonologist or intensivist is appropriate. Treatment of severe asthma. Oxygen administration. Oxygen should be provided to all patients with severe asthma, even those with normal oxygenation. The goal is to maintain oxygen saturation above 92%. Successful treatment with beta agonists may initially cause a decrease in oxygen saturation because bronchodilation may increase the ventilation perfusion mismatch. Inhaled beta-2 agonists. Albuterol, also known as salbutamol, provides rapid dose-dependent bronchodilation with minimal side effects. The same dose can be used in most patients regardless of age or size. Continuous administration was more effective in patients with severe exacerbations of asthma and was more cost-effective in pediatric trials. A typical dose of albuterol by nebulizer is 2.5 or 5 mg every 15 to 20 minutes intermittently, or continuous nebulization at a dose of 10 to 15 mg per hour. Levalbuterol is the R isomer of albuterol and has shown equivalent or slight improvement in bronchodilation compared with albuterol in the emergency department. Further studies are needed before definitive recommendations can be made. Corticosteroids. Systemic corticosteroids are the only proven treatment for the inflammatory component of asthma. The onset of their anti-inflammatory effects occurs 6 to 12 hours after administration. Early use of systemic steroids reduces rates of hospital admission. Providers should administer steroids as early as possible, but should not expect immediate effects. There is no difference in clinical effects between oral and intravenous formulations of corticosteroids. The intravenous route is preferable because patients with near-fatal asthma may vomit or be unable to swallow. A typical initial adult dose of methylprednisolone is 125 milligrams with a dose range of 40 to 250 milligrams. Adjunctive therapies with anticholinergics. 
Ipratropium bromide is an anticholinergic bronchodilator related to atropine. It produces a modest improvement in lung function compared with albuterol alone. The nebulizer dose is 0.5 milligrams. It has a slow onset of action with peak effectiveness at 60 to 90 minutes and no systemic side effects. Ipratropium should be considered an adjunct to albuterol. Tiotropium is a newer, longer-acting anticholinergic currently undergoing clinical testing for use in acute asthma. Magnesium sulfate. Intravenous magnesium sulfate can modestly improve pulmonary function when combined with nebulized beta-adrenergic agents and corticosteroids. Magnesium causes bronchial smooth muscle relaxation independent of serum magnesium levels with minor side effects like flushing and lightheadedness. A typical adult dose is 1.2 to 2 grams given intravenously over 20 minutes. Nebulized magnesium sulfate also improved pulmonary function during acute asthma, but did not reduce the rate of hospitalization. Epinephrine and terbutaline are adrenergic agents that can be given subcutaneously to patients with acute severe asthma. The dose of subcutaneous epinephrine is 0.01 mg per kilogram divided into three doses of approximately 0.3 mg given at 20-minute intervals. Terbutaline is given in a dose of 0.25 mg subcutaneously and can be repeated in 30 to 60 minutes. These drugs are more commonly administered to children with acute asthma. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation. Non-invasive positive pressure ventilation may offer short-term support to patients with acute respiratory failure and may delay or eliminate the need for endotracheal intubation. This therapy requires an alert patient with adequate spontaneous respiratory effort. Bilevel positive airway pressure allows for separate control of inspiratory and expiratory pressures. Endotracheal intubation with mechanical ventilation. Endotracheal intubation does not solve the problem of small airway constriction in patients with severe asthma. Intubation and positive pressure ventilation can trigger further bronchoconstriction and complications such as breath stacking and barotrauma. Elective intubation should be performed if the asthmatic patient deteriorates despite aggressive management. Rapid sequence intubation is the technique of choice. Use the largest endotracheal tube available usually 8 or 9 millimeters, to decrease airway resistance. Confirm endotracheal tube placement immediately after intubation and obtain a chest radiograph. Troubleshooting after intubation. When severe bronchoconstriction is present, breath stacking can develop during positive pressure ventilation, leading to complications such as hyperinflation, tension pneumothorax, and hypotension. Use a slower respiratory rate of 6 to 10 breaths per minute with smaller tidal volumes of 6 to 8 milliliters per kilogram, shorter inspiratory time, and longer expiratory time. Mild hypoventilation reduces the risk of barotrauma. Sedation is often required to optimize ventilation and minimize barotrauma after intubation. Continue to administer inhaled albuterol treatments through the endotracheal tube. For common causes of acute deterioration in any intubated patient are recalled by the mnemonic dope. Tube displacement, tube obstruction, pneumothorax, and equipment failure. Verify endotracheal tube position. Eliminate tube obstruction. Rule out or decompress a pneumothorax. And check the ventilator circuit for leaks or malfunction. Cardiac arrest in the asthmatic patient. When the asthmatic patient experiences cardiac arrest, there is inadequate evidence to recommend for or against the use of heliox during cardiac arrest. There is insufficient evidence to recommend compression of the chest wall to relieve gas, trapping, if dynamic hyperinflation occurs. Summary When treating patients with severe asthma, providers should closely monitor patients to detect further deterioration or development of complications. When there is no improvement and intubation is required, these patients require the care of experienced providers in an intensive care setting. Some tertiary centers can offer experimental therapies as a last resort, and transfer should be considered for patients with near-fatal asthma that is refractory to aggressive medical management.
Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel by clicking the subscription button. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment below in the comments section.